I grew up in the bush. I grew up in the mountains running around barefoot. And that really shaped the worldview with which I am presenting the information and research today. So I always think it's important to, to give a second to acknowledge that. And for my daughter, Zyra. Now, Future Ancestor Services, um, again, you heard what we do, but I want to underscore the fa my favorite part of the work that we do is mm -hmm. that we are all Black, Indigenous, and racialized. We are nearly all queer, and we are nearly all disabled. Um, actually, my entire team is, is either autistic, ADHD, chronically depressed, physically disabled, and or typically two or more of those things. And so when we think about how we do our work as artists, as policy writers, as activists, um, we also focus not just on the work outputs, but on the ways that we relate to each other and community across space and time as we create that work. And so that's my favorite part about doing this work. Um, I will make a note. Um, my disabilities include brain damage from a brain bleed. And I've been traveling quite a bit for work and I, I'm feeling inflammation in the front of my brain right now. And so you might find that I stutter on words or that I might forget what I'm saying mid-sentence. And that, that just has to do with where I am in my healing journey. I lost my sight, my vision, <laughs> my speech. And so I'm still on that journey. And so you might see that it comes through today. And so I just want to ask for patience for that. But um. I'm really excited with what y'all are doing here. This has been an incredible time being on campus and, and meeting with you and students this morning. Thank you so much for joining us and new faces. Um, and I really like what y'all are doing. And, and I look to the, when I was creating this uh, presentation, I really looked to kind of what y'all are doing, contemplate our impact on the health of our water systems, the importance of forming networks and partnerships to increase availability to um, access to safe water and then informing challenge um, challenging and encouraging action. So I did my best to make this session as action oriented as possible and to provide language that not only facilitates partnerships across cultures, um, but facilitates the relationships we have to our own value, our own knowledge, our own communities, and to be able to communicate that, especially in resistant spaces especially in spaces where they tell us our traditional knowledge is not valuable, our traditional knowledge is not legitimate. And so that's really where this content is coming from. And so first I wanna talk about colonization, climate change and racism. Um, so really what does one have to do with the other? Climate change and climate justice has everything to do with any of the work that we're doing. And I, I really like the way that um, some of this research kind of illuminates on. So that's what I'm gonna be covering in this first part. And the second part, I'm gonna be talking about decolonization and indigenization as innovation. So I'm going to kind of break down what I mean when I say decolonizing, what I mean when I say indigenizing, and I'm gonna give really concrete examples of how we've seen indigenous traditional knowledge um, and non-Western knowledge used as a way to innovate in partnerships and in how we're creating institutions and movements. And then finally, just in sustainable futures. So I'm gonna be speaking especially to how we frame success and our relationship to success and how we can reorient that in a way that better holds space to honor climate justice and traditional knowledge. Um, and so I recognize there is just a plethora of backgrounds and interests here from engineering to dances and the arts. And so I'm gonna to try to make this as relevant as possible. And I hope that you take away something, even if it's one thing or one point from this presentation. I will also give you the opportunity maybe right away, um, if it's easier for you to read along, there's a QR code. And so if you want to download the slides before I get started, um, you're welcome to do so. And then for the people joining us, hey, <laughs> um, if you wanna scan the QR code, you'll be able to um, access the slide deck as we're going through. And then this QR code is at the end of the presentation as well, if you would like to, um, to scan it then. And I will say too, for the people physically in the room, if you need to get up and leave for whatever reason, please don't feel guilty or feel like it's disrespectful to me. Uh, please move as you need to. 
Um, especially if I, I know it can be hard to sit in front of a screen for so long. So if you need to get up and stretch and go to the back of the room, like please, or the sides, there's nice space on the sides. Please do what you need to do to feel comfortable in this space. Oftentimes I end up sitting on the ground. Um, so really you can do whatever you want to be comfortable and to make this uh, space accessible to you. Are there any questions before I, I move on? All right, how do the living legacies of colonialism intertwine with climate change and racism? This is one of my favorite topics and I'm gonna provide some clinical definitions and this is not to patronize you. This is not to assume that you don't know what I'm talking about, but it's also not to assume that you do at least from the way I'm using it and the way that I'm speaking about colonization. So I wanted to provide just a bit of shared language. So colonizing is a physical and ideological domination of peoples in order to separate them from their culture and resources while creating external and internalized assumption of the supremacy of the colonizer. Now, I really like this definition because it highlights a couple of things here. Um, one of them being the extraction of resources and access to resources. If we think about how Canada came to be, how the US came to be, and what was the interest in explorers discovering our territories and discovering our lands, um, it has to do with resource extraction. If we think of the transatlantic slave trade, it has to do with resource extraction. Canada and the US were created and our systems and our laws were established for the purpose of extracting, controlling natural resources, and then using stolen indigenous peoples and humans in order to extract those resources. And so as these countries developed as settler colonial states, we see four common characteristics of colonialism, and this is really underscored in the racial and cultural inequality. So we see these practices and we see these necessities, these essential points, political and legal domination over an alien society. We need people to be disconnected from the land if we want to control them. If we want to come in and impose our own laws, our own social norms, our own economies, we need to disempower and disassociate peoples from our resources and from our strength, from our cultures, our languages. And so racial and cultural inequality is a necessity. Discrimination, racism is a necessity for the colonial project to be effective and to maintain its effectiveness. And so climate, and again, this is coming back to the interest of um, natural resource extraction. Now I'm gonna come back to this point, especially because it's really important, but I wanna focus in terms of colonialism on the racial and cultural inequality, um, and especially in how we see it. Um, oh, so I'm pushing the wrong button. Especially as we see it in our lives today. And this is where we can look at worldviews. Um, so let me kind of give an example. Um, I'm going to go through two living legacies of colonialism. So how we see these characteristics um, come up in the way that we live today in our day-to-day -day lives. So the living legacies of colonialism. I'm going to read this um, excerpt from Braiding Streetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. In the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital, or natural resources. So we have here one more worldview and a consequential relationship to earth, where we see earth as to be owned, to be extracted from, and, and kind of this, this uh, uh, non-living entity to be owned. And that we see this enshrined in policies and laws. We see this, we see this as um, a social norm, for sure. And this is the truth. But to our people, it was everything, identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained us. And so here we see another worldview and the consequential relationship to earth, where it's true that earth is an extension of self. 
Earth is the home of our non-human kinfolk. Earth and my access to Earth is my access to language, is my access to medicine, is my access to my education. Now, where we see so much harm caused, especially when we're looking at environmental movements and spaces, when we look at the ways that arts are just de are, are made to be inferior um, with regards to our approaches to environmental work and environmental movements, this really illustrates kind of where a lot of that harm comes from. Where one truth and worldview are considered and positioned as the objective, legitimate truth. We often see this through Western science, the non-biased, objective truth. And that this is a truth too, but because it is not born from a settler worldview, it is considered too spiritual, too biased, because our understanding, our worldview, that's not biased, but this is biased. Or at best, nice to have, but still needs to be validated through our worldview first. And so we see here a hierarchy of worldviews, and there are a lot of consequences to that. I want to illustrate one from our kin in the north, um, in Yukon. I've had the opportunity to work with Indigenous peoples in Yukon. And what's so exciting about what's happening in the North is that there's so much necessity-based uh, cooperation that takes place. Because if you don't cooperate, if you don't figure your problems out with the people you got problems with, you aren't getting food to your community. You're not getting water in your community over the winter. And so there is this element of requirement that has just bred so much innovation between indigenous and non-indigenous entities and institutions. But it's been a rocky, violent journey. And so in 1948, Champagne and Ayashik uh, First Nations and the Kluane First Nation, which are all in what is currently the Yukon in Canada and across um, into Alaska as well, um, they experienced this very violent separation from their land when their traditional territories were claimed as Kluane Game Sanctuary. And under cons conservation efforts, people were removed from the land in order to preserve wilderness. Now, this was based on the understanding of terra nullius, the idea of nobody's land, the idea that um, humans have to be separate from the natural world in order for it to be considered wilderness. And when settlers came and discovered the US and discovered Canada, indigenous peoples were not considered civilized enough to re, um, regard our claim to these territories that we care give. And therefore nobody's land allowed for our ideological and structural domination, yes. But terra nullius, the idea that we have to be separate from wilderness in order to consider it wilderness is again that worldview and the hierarchy of worldviews. And oftentimes we see this illustrated in the biology kind of ecosystem sheets. And if you think back to maybe some biology classes that you took or when you started learning about ecosystems, very rarely are humans placed in the ecosystem. You'll often see apex predators being the bears, the wolves, that's remnants and that's a worldview and the consequential relationship to ecosystem. But when I go to my people, when we talk about ecosystems, we include ourselves in our understanding of that ecosystem. Because to include ourselves in the ecosystem is to acknowledge that we have responsibility and impact within that ecosystem. When we remove ourselves from understanding ourselves as within an ecosystem, then there's a degree of responsibility and accountability we don't need to acknowledge. And so this kind of relationship to wilderness ended up being the justification for, again, the violent removal of these people from our lands and from their lands. Now, 
biologically and even in the ecosystem, it had drastic, horrible impacts, not only on the people who experienced cultural genocide, um, state sanctioned violence and intergenerational trauma as a result of this hierarchy of worldviews and the delegitimatization of indigenous worldviews. But then we also saw the ecosystems completely stable, destabilized where there had been for time immemorial necessity-based hunting of um, an apex predator, wolves, we now all of a sudden saw an influx of wolf population that decimates an ecosystem. And that's what they witnessed as they started implementing Western and settler approaches to conservation. It ended up hurting Earth more by disqualifying and um, leaving Indigenous peoples out of the process. Now, um, I, I, I did a really interesting interview with Robin Bradash, who was part of the work um, that looked at um, restoring the harm that was caused. So in 1972, this park became a national park. And so in that process and recognizing how violent and crappy it was to do that, they agreed, okay, we'll co-manage a national park. We're gonna change it to a national park. Y'all can go back, y'all can go. Um, I mean, just forget what we did, sorry. You can go back to the land and we'll co-manage it. But it very quickly became very real that the intergenerational trauma was really affecting people's access and ability to access their relationship to nature that had been honored for generations before. And so uh, healing broken connections in 2004, after about almost three decades, um, healing broken connections was a project that they did to a restorative process that they did to start to develop the co-management regime. And I talked to Robin Bradash, who was um, a leader uh, on this project. And when talking about kind of her experience in working with scientists and her experience in working with policymakers, this is what she said. We were talking about reintroducing the original people to the park. And it was so frustrating to me that the scientists were not able to recognize that people had been removed and that that had had an impact. Not only an impact on the land, but an impact on the people. There was such a lack of understanding around the true connection indigenous peoples have with the land. So a relationship to earth that is completely different from those who had the power to create the policies and the program and the conservation efforts. And that brings me to my next point. Indigenous relationships to earth has been and always will be a threat to settler colonial projects. Now, no, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go all the way back. But when we're talking about removal from natural resources, when we're talking about economic, political, legal dependency on a settler state, on a colonial state like the US or like Canada, we see all of um, we see indigenous relationships to earth being used to justify that and to create that. So let me just read this point again from Braiding Sweetgrass. Whether it was their homeland or the new land forced upon them, land held in common gave people strength. It gave them something to fight for. And so in the eyes of the federal government, that belief was a threat. The rural enslaved population of the antebellum South had an intimate and cooperative relationship with the natural world one that enabled them to develop critical skills that maximized their chances of successfully escaping slavery permanent, permanently. Further, the Southern plantation owners had increasingly removed themselves from the land and had a much more remote relationship with the natural world, a factor that made it more difficult for them to control their slave, <coughs> slave labor and to find fugitives once they had escaped. So it has never been in the interest for us to have a relationship to earth that we could honor because we were able to find dependency on each other. We were able to create um, our own systems of law, of policy, of economy 
so much of which is informed by relationships to earth. So when we think of, well, yeah, it does make sense. Indigenous relationships to earth would be a threat because land held in collective challenges capitalist value of private property. And if we go back to why Canada or the US, again, were created, created in the first place in the way that it was, it was to extract and control natural resources in a growing capitalist, globalizing economy. And so it makes sense that respect and reciprocity with Earth challenges those goals. It makes sense that a spiritual component are often deemed too religious, bias, or supplementary. They don't have an interest in us honoring our relationships to Earth in this way because it challenges those intentions. Now, how does this look in our day-to-day -day lives? It looks like absence of intergenerational teachings from the natural world, loss of cultural identity, history, language, an understanding that we don't belong in the outdoors or environmental spaces, geographic barriers to accessing natural spaces, including the absence of green spaces in predominantly non-white communities, Urban planning is actually really interesting when you start thinking about um, this idea of relationship to land and earth. We see these in our day-to-day -day lives. And what I, I, before I move on, what gets me so excited about this kind of research and understanding this kind of history is because we can make sense of how actions and inactions that our ancestors had and that the group and collective ancestors had, those actions and inactions shaped our realities today. And when we look to history in that way, when we look to history to understand how um, did those actions and inactions impact us today, we're better positioned to then ask, well, how are my actions and inactions impacting not only my present reality, but our future realities? Because whether I choose to acknowledge that or not, whether my ancestors chose to acknowledge or not, they were shaping the realities we inherited. And even if you think of time travel, any kind of movie or film about time travel, it's usually about going back in time and changing one very, very, very small thing. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And so if you apply that to your own actions and inactions and recognizing how, like to me, that's just so empowering and it's healing. When I'm able to read this research, when I'm able to read research about the slave practice, practices that took place in Jamaica that specifically looked to isolate fathers from the family unit and the violence that was perpetrated, especially against fathers and indigenous peoples that were stolen and brought to indi and stole stolen indigenous lands. And where for generations, when I say generations, I'm only talking about like five or six generations ago, where we see those practices um, that played out where my families are from. When I look to the kind of relationship or lack thereof that I have with my father and the, his abilities to be a father, it's when I find that history, it's when I find that research where I'm better able to see myself in a legacy that lives today. That my relationship with my father isn't one father's failure to love his kids. It isn't something that I necessarily did. But to be able to see that in, within a living legacy was how I was able to heal so much from that trauma, where I was able to address the intergenerational trauma in a moment where I am not passing that on to my daughter. And so when I share that kind of research, that's what the intention that I share that, is to not disempower us, but is to really see how we are navigating the actions and inactions of the, those who came before us. And to recognize that so many of the adversities that we do face isn't a direct result of our own inabilities or inactions. And that's not to say, be gone with personal accountability and, and action, but that's to say that it helps contextualize our realities. 
in a way that for me is very empowering and that inspires agency. Now, how are decolonization and indigenization innovative? So when I was talking about the Healing Broken Connections project in the Yukon, where we saw this restorative process take place, one of the amazing outcomes of this restorative process, it was five years, that took place between the indigenous peoples and the government was this idea of cultural reintegration as an ecological mark of integrity. And so when they look at assessing the success of the environmental efforts and conservation efforts in Kluane National Park, the cultural reintegration, the indigenous people's reintegration into land use and being on those lands is considered a mark of success, is brought, has been brought in. So we're not just looking at numbers or data, but we're looking at the ceremonies that are, that are taking place on the land. We're looking at community feedback on how land-based art and learning is improving throughout the years, where now it is um, a measurable and expected outcome of the conservation efforts. That is innovative. And that's what I love about decolonization and indigenization being positioned as innovation. It's because when we look to our traditional ways, when we look to the ways that our people were and are pre-colonial contact, and we look to how can their, those teachings, how can our cultures impact and influence our realities today, we open those doors for, again, the innovation. Now, decolonization, um, that's a clinical definition. How I like to explain it in a really simple way is just decolonization is the process of unpacking and understanding and being able to see the living legacies of colonialism. It's that process of unpacking and creating voids, essentially. Sometimes we have to create voids in our policy structure, in our, in our truths, but it's understanding the way colonialism has influenced our minds, our truths, our spaces. Decolonization does not necessitate that, necessitate that we fill that in and that why it will never be enough, but it's that process of creating um, openings. I wanna share a really interesting example of this. And, very relevant to environmental spaces, but then also just to your lives. Um, let's maybe look at decolonizing our relationship to time. So how we understand and relate to time is a living colonial legacy in terms of at least the social norm and what we have to navigate day in and day out in our institutions. So by the beginning of the 19th century, we see this growing industrialization taking place in Britain. And we see a growing interest to um, globalize a capitalist economy. And so we see colonies being created on our ancestors' lands around the world. And there was this ideological rupture that was starting to kind of take place. Because post-French um, Revolution, we have these ideas and ideals of human freedom, equality, rights. Yeah. We have the church, the church teaching human equality, rights, liberty. But then we have this dilemma where we're also treating humans in some of the most inhumane and violent ways. We're stealing indigenous people from Africa. We're bringing them to stolen indigenous territories. We're committing genocide. We're, we're committing the most atrocious collective actions against collective people and earth. And so how do we resolve the fact that we still wanna keep doing that, but we're also preaching this? And this is where we see race science emerge. Um, if you're interested in race science and even a lot of this, the history of white people by Nell Irvin Paint Painter, the history of white people is incredible and it examines how race science has been used to rectify this ideological rupture this um 
Miss, yeah, I, I won't get too deep into that, but um, relationship to time was also used as a way to justify our domination. Because if we're less than human, it's okay. Phrenology, the study of our skulls and the shape of our skulls was used to do this. Again, going back to race science, where this is a fully evolved human and this human is deserving of rights and needs or, and liberty. This is also the source of ableism and um, patriarchy. This is a source of a lot of discrimination. And again, it all goes back to resource extraction. It all goes back to the interest in extracting human and natural resources, which is why I say climate justice is an everything issue. Um, but in order to say these people are fully evolved and deserving of rights, and these people, these indigenous people, they're actually closer to animals. So it's okay if we treat them like this because they're not fully human. Our relationships to time was a way to justify that colonization. It was a way to justify and depict indigenous peoples as being in need of civilization. They saw us eating when we wanted to. My peoples didn't have three meals a day in the way that is imposed on us. They saw that and marked it uncivilized, marked it as not true religion, and they used that as a justification to impose onto us their legal norms, political power, economies. Um, and this is really interesting, too, because they positioned us as not only um, out of place, but also out of time. We didn't prioritize the accurate measurement of time as the ideal way to experience time. My ancestors didn't work the same year, way all year round. A productive use of time for my peoples was rest, having seasons of rest. Napping in the day was regarded as productive. Spending time learning our ancestral languages was valued as productive. Now, how do we see this kind of colonial legacy play out? And I will say too, Indian time, African time, island time, that's all real experiences. And we've been taught to degrade those experiences of time as invaluable, as a nuisance, as all of these negative things. Time and, and um, energy being invested in the arts. And in how many of our people's cultures, especially pre-colonial contact, but then also to get us through colonial contact, regarded um, arts as a productive and valuable use of time. This is like, this is probably the most life-changing information in history that I've kind of encountered in my, my years in academia. Um, especially when I think of and start again, decolonizing what it means to relate to time and productivity and how we see that today. We often see steady urgency culture in projecting our expectations of time use without consideration of circumstance, identity, um, experiences, et cetera. We see time for rest and being on the land as kind of supplementary or optional, but not foundational to the work that we do often. Um, Health-related activities like going to the doctors is often seen as a nuisance versus a productive use of time. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Time needed for emotional recovery of racism and discrimination, of collective trauma. The best teachers that I had and educators that I had were the ones that were able to come up in front of the class and say, I recognize what we're seeing in the news today is going to affect your capacity to be in here. And depending on who you are and where you come from, this might not be the primary thing on your mind right now. Recognizing that as a valuable space to hold, as a valuable use of our time to say, we need to recover from this. Let's go on the land or let's, let's do a healing practice. Let's engage in art. Again, it's not often seen or projected to be a valuable use of our time. 
And again, this is born from that racial and cultural inequality and hierarchy that is necessitated in colonial states. I really love this piece and this kind of transitions into the next part. Indigenous peoples in both settings often successfully, um, something word, something word, I can't see it behind the zoom, either to defy the imposition of clock govern culture, to establish compromises between the new and the old rhythms, um, or to exploit the temporal discourses of their self-styled reformers. This suggests that time in the colonial context may be seen as a two-edged sword, not only as an instrument of colonial power, but also a medium for anti-colonial resistance. Um, and so I had another slide, but I, I didn't include it this time. Um, here we are. What I love about this is that what we do with our time and how we reimagine our time and assert that onto others to protect ourselves, our communities, our teachings, our, our worldviews, our ancestries, um, it can be used as anti-colonial resistance. And th again, this is where I found research so empowering and brings me to the concept of indigenization. So if we're taking out and creating all these voids and unpacking colonization, the way I like to understand and really simply explain indigenization is to now not only fill those voids, but reshape those voids completely by naturalizing indigenous ways of knowing and being. And so this is where we move from the perform often performative nature of, of uh, decolonization, indigenization work. And that naturalizing part is really key because it, it's naturalizing that truth as true, as legitimate alongside Western truths. Now, when I think about my journey with decolonization and indigenization at even Future Ancestor Services, We've gone through this process where, for example, we look at decolonizing our relationship to time. And we ask, well, our ancestors didn't exist this way. Again, our ancestors didn't live the same way all year round. And they sure as hell didn't expect people with disabilities to do that in so many ways. And, and this isn't to romanticize indigenous cultures, but this is to say that there was so much value in seeing people with disabilities, neurodivergent people as sacred. In many of our cultures, those people were revered as sacred. And so when we ask, okay, how is the relationship to productivity and time harmed us and our peoples? We started by asking that question. And that's when we started realizing, oh, my discomfort with rest has more to do with my understanding that I'm not being productive. And therefore I'm getting really anxious about not being productive because I don't think rest is productive. So unpacking that and confronting that within ourselves. And then the process of indigenization looked like, okay, well then what do we fill it with? So we asked ourselves, how did our ancestors live? How did they exist? Again, didn't work the same way all year round. And so being in Canada, where we definitely have a lot of seasons, we asked ourselves, how do our bodies change? How do our needs change as disabled people, especially throughout the seasons? And what do we need? When are our, our needs for rest most pronounced throughout a season, seasonal cycle? That's where we start asking, and um, we do a lot of our work in Machif, French, and English. And so this is Machif, winter, spring, summer, fall. And we start putting post-it notes on like these quadrants. Um, and then we, then we ask ourselves, what work do we have to do throughout the year in order to honor the way our bodies relate to the natural world throughout the year? or where we know we need, to, we need to protect our time for rest in these seasons especially, because we can't control, but there is a huge demand for our, our work at, in this season, or when we do need rest. So this is a process that we've gone through in terms of decolonizing the way that we relate to time and then indigenizing 
through a seasonal work cycle that we've created with the support of elders and community members that we work with. And this is where we can see such an exciting experience of innovation. Innovation is not only born from techno technological advancement. When we hold space and go back to apply our ancestors' traditional knowledge um, to our contemporary realities, we have the opportunity to learn from their actions and inactions and find innovation in justice and accountability across past, present, and future generations. Oftentimes, they won't call the arts innovative. They won't call liberal sciences or social sciences, sciences innovative, innovative. We often don't see innovation talked about in a lot of our, our work and spaces. And it's because innovation is so often, and a relationship to innovation is so often restricted to technological advancements in science. But when we hold space to acknowledge that this is innovative, to apply our ways of knowing into our contemporary realities, and to use the language as innovation, then we can begin to challenge that relationship to innovation. And we begin to name, this is my relationship to innovation. Why are you telling me that this is less valuable or less authentic or less legitimate than your own? Now in my last kind of slide deck before I kind of open the floor. Um, and I'm gonna go over this quite quickly, but um, in terms of actionable pathways forward, I mean, I've named a couple in terms of relationship to time, in terms of seasonal work cycle, yay. Um, but I'm gonna talk about a few more things just because again, we looked at worldview, relationship to earth um, and really <clears throat> how climate justice is truly connected to the forms of discrimination that we see today. Again, the inequality and the racism that we experience in what is currently US and Canada, when we think of our contemporary experiences with these um, realities, we can, again, trace it back to natural resource extraction and control. And when we address and we hold space to acknowledge that, we improve our capacity to be more effective in addressing ableism, in addressing racism, in our work and through our art. When we look at decolonization and indigenization as innovation, I just want to bring innovation into the conversation and to expand our understanding of innovation to hold value for non-settler, non-Western truths. And then finally, right now, I wanna talk about some actionable pathways forward. And this isn't to say that you don't already think like this or you don't already do this, but hopefully this is a language that you may find useful as you start to ruminate and apply kind of what we've talked about today. So just as I've talked about relationship to earth, relationship to time and productivity and how that's all born from our worldviews, we also have a relationship to success. And in many Western institutions and cultures, it's student grades, it's the number of people who enroll, it's the number of people in bums and seats, it's the profit, it's the donations collect, collected, it's how many followers we got. That's often positioned as success. And when it's completed, we've been successful. Yay. But what often ends up happening is that when we look at this, these are actually tools to achieve success. The success isn't a grade A on your paper, but it's what you learned and how you can apply that knowledge. A lot of programs and institutions do that though where it's okay, we had this many um, students graduate, yay. Or we collected this many donations, yay. But what I often see is when I go into organizations and they've brought us in for a little PR crisis, what ends up happening is that their understanding of success was donations collected and it was limited to that. So yeah, they got their, they got their donations, but in the process they experienced an exodus of non-white employees or all of their queer employees. And so, yeah, on paper, by those metrics of success, yeah, you, you achieved your success. But what those markers and what that understanding of success did not capture was the relations with which you achieved that success 
and the relations that you intend to have following the completion of that task. And that's where we see really strong limitations um, with a limited kind of scope and truth about what success is. And then often, and even further, is that when we ask who's defining what success is, who is saying what is a valuable or successful, um, what, what success looks like, who's saying that? And oftentimes, this is where we see that hierarchy of worldviews and truths legitimatized and given a structure. Um, and, and maybe just as a really quick kind of to make it more relevant, uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Lorne Foster in Canada, was doing research and he was looking at why white professors were consistently hired over Black and Indigenous professors for African studies and indigenous studies courses. This was happening a lot at the university. And so what he looked at, when he looked at the assessment process and whose success was deemed to be more qualified than others, well, in the structure, it says, okay, peer reviewed, published in these kind of, art, in these kind of journals is the most ideal level of success that we could look for in a candidate. And so a lot of non-Black and non-Indigenous applicants were able to demonstrate that. But then when he looked at the gap, what about the public and community work? He saw that this is where Indigenous and Black applicants were exceedingly well at doing and achieved incredible success with over 200 publications, community review projects, but it was not regarded as success in the academic institution's eyes. And when he even dove further, he was able to see and illuminate these trends that the Black and Indigenous applicants were overwhelmingly interested in their research being publicly accessible because they were serving communities that are neglected in ways that other people's communities aren't by state services, by um, common dominant kind of interest in, the, in our issues. And so while these black and indigenous applicants are overwhelmingly responding to trauma and crises in our communities through our work, it wasn't regarded as successful. And so this is where we really see how success and qualification reinforces that hierarchy of worldview that I talked about at the beginning. Now, framing success relationally holds space for us to think about success beyond the numbers, activities, checkboxes. And so a really kind of simple way that I like to think about um, success and relational success is asking this question, what do healthy and ethical relationships look like with regards to my relationship to time, relationship to work, relationship to money, relationship to earth? And to use relational language, when I ask um, in terms of a collective, what do healthy and ethical relationships look like with regards to our organization's relationship to healthy and trauma-informed work, relationship to earth? And so what we end up getting is relational language. We feel supported in understanding money and finances when we think about our collective relationship to money at, the organ at my company. We want a consistent and reliable payment schedule. Um, we have more financial literacy and planning support from our team. Um, Destigmatizing our relationship to money, being transparent about how much each of us makes. Everyone has the same opportunity to make more money. And so when talking about success in this way, we stay very clear of numbers. And we ask, how do we want to feel? How do these relationships look like? And a lot, a lot of grants, a lot of programs are not set up to acknowledge this or to assess this. But that's where you get into then asking, okay, then how do we achieve this? And that's where the numbers come in. That's where the tasks, that's where the donations needed. That's where employees, quotas, 
That's where that comes in. But we start with that relational language first. And this has really supported us in breaking from those binds of a colonial worldview that we've been so exposed to and naturalized in our own truths at the cost of de, um, dehumanizing and devaluing um, the knowledge that we all carry through our blood memory and through our peoples. So here are some practices that you could do to kind of explore your relationship to earth. Um, because if I bring it back to our environmental movement, if I bring this whole conversation back to environmentalism and advocating for earth and advocating for a healthier relationship to earth, I really enjoy starting off with that conversation about what our relationship to earth is. What is your personal relationship to earth? How do you express that? Um, how does a lack of access to nature impact my mental and physical health? What about when I do have access to nature? Have my experiences in nature or lack thereof influenced my identity and values? How does my home environment reflect my relationship to land? What gifts do I receive when I access nature? These are the kind of questions that, again, you likely already kind of know and think and experience in the way that you exist now. But taking the time to journal this for yourself, taking the time to ask these kind of questions for yourself and for your collective, how is a relationship to earth articulated as valuable in my work materials and statements? Who is involved and non-involved in defining our, our work and relationship to earth? In what ways do our current relationships harm the well-being of earth and our relationship to her? There is space for these conversations in science. There is space for this con these conversations in policy. When we are looking for and asserting the value of arts and creativity in environmental movement, this is what can hold space for that and create space for that in a way that it's really truly positioned as fundamental to the effect in, in fact, uh, effectiveness of our work and of the environmental movement. And so again, there's a, there's a couple more <laughs> spaces or questions. This one's one of my favorite. How does my environmentalism position humans as a part of natural ecosystems and not separate from? And again, you probably, or many of you probably already think that way, but taking the time to put that into words and to be prepared to say that on the spot, <clears throat> on the spot, can be really effective in terms of not only advocating for yourself, but advocating for the peoples you belong to and serve. And including Earth and uh, non-human kin in our, as a stakeholder or shareholder in our analysis, if we get a little bit more technical. It's really exciting to position Earth as a place of accountability, a source of our accountability. Now that doesn't come naturally from a settler or Western worldview at least in the way that we exist and have to navigate today. So even asking what this would look like, if one were considering our impact, placing Earth as a shareholder, as a stakeholder in our work, that affects the planning, that affects resource allocation in really, really exciting ways. And then there's, again, a couple more kind of pieces that you can do in your work. Now, this is why I provided a, key, uh, a QR code is that you can access the slides, but you can also access a lot of the resources that I've shared today. Again, I've expressed a lot of times that like, I love research and I love history so much because of how empowering and healing it's been for me and that I've seen how it's been for my peoples. Um, and these are some of the kind of articles and sources that I've been able, been able to really lean on and use um, in a lot of significant ways where I've been able to go into, like we work with every federal ministry in Canada, um, but we always ensure that we work with 30 to 40% artist run organizations, um, activist led, grassroots led organizations, because um, it's so important to stay grounded in those realities and the frontline realities and, and needs and interests and voices. And it's often been these kind of resources that have facilitated our 
bringing of those experiences and that insight into those more resistant spaces. And so this is really where we've been able to find the language to move between and within those institutions and cultures um, and worldviews. Now, if we come back to why I was here in the first place, <laughs> um, to especially on the, on the importance of, in, of forming networks and partnerships to increase availability and access to safe water. The reason why I really focused on worldview and understanding how some of our truths are actual threats, not just to certain institutions and sectors, but to the US and Canadian identity and how it exists as a whole. It, at least for me, it makes sense of why this work is so hard and why this work is so fundamental, not just in what we're creating, but in how we exist and our truths. And so that's really why I wanted to bring this kind of conversation into the space of accessing safe water and advocating for ourselves and our communities, advocating for our practices in spaces that can get very technical very quickly. Um, and then I also wanted to keep it pretty action oriented. So I hope you are leaving with some really concrete um, critical self-reflection questions, again, resources, um, and even kind of thinking about for yourself, how do you want to align how you exist throughout the year with a seasonal work cycle? What would that look like for you personally? Um, these are all kind of just different ways that I like to kind of share and um, get excited about, again, decolonization and indigenization as innovation. Um, and so I will wrap up with another um, a quote from Braiding Sweetgrass. And if you haven't already read it, it's an incredible book that examines um, indigenous approaches and worldview to science um, and especially environmental sciences. Um, but it, even if your interest isn't in environmental science, um, the art and the poetry that she brings in throughout the book, the humor that she brings throughout the book, um, feels like I'm listening to an auntie. Um, that's really what it's, that's really how I, I read that book. And uh, she says uh, early on in the book, the land knows you even when you are lost. And as the land becomes impoverished, so too does the scope of our vision. And I really love this because it's not only inspires hope for me, but it also inspires urgency. Um, and the urgency can be heavy and it can weigh so hard. And I really like to think like, we don't need to be everything to everyone. We don't need to be doing everything we don't need to be on the ground organizing and um, in the policy rooms and in everyone's houses calling out the racist cousins. We don't need to be everything to everyone. But as long as we find those channels of change and we, we are able to dedicate ourselves to that work, even if it's just for ourselves at this point in our journeys, it will make an impact. And again, I like to think of time travel where we're coming back and changing one small thing. Maybe one small thing could be the reflection that you do with one of my reflection questions um, or reading one of the articles I just included. Um, but to me, that's so empowering. But then the urgency that we don't have time to not do anything. And so that's, um, and again, earth is healing. Earth um, is where we see an extension of self, our communities, our histories, um, and there's so much power to that. And it's relevant to any of your work, no matter your practice, no matter your discipline. Um, and when we hold that relationship to earth more consciously, we become better caregivers of that earth. And so with that, I'll shut up. <laughs> and uh, here's the QR code and uh, ways that you can stay in contact with me. Um, and then I'll hang around a little bit more um, if you don't have to rush off the class to, to chat and hang out. Um, but thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Y'all have been so great. Um, and I'm looking forward to any connections that kind of stay with us. So. Thank you so much to Larissa for that. Um, we are going to have um, a little bit of time for Q&A, but um, before we do that, Larissa really wanted to um, give voice to uh, one of the students that she met earlier about uh, 
really wonderful program that connects locally to a lot of the things that Larissa spoke uh, about. So, um, woo -woo. <laughs> I was like, I hope they're talking about me and I'm gonna get up and get really embarrassed. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi Jerry, nice to see you. Um, my name is Catalina Salas. I'm a PhD student here in environmental science and engineering. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I, I get to work with a bunch of really amazing people that are in this room, but I wanna share a nonprofit that's located in New Mexico. If you wanna get a taste of what Larissa does with her work, this nonprofit like lives and breathes that same mission. So they do everything with being human um, and they're a farm nonprofit. They're called La Semilla. If you haven't heard about them, they're super amazing. They have a cultural fellowship that opens in the summer. And so you guys can all apply to that. Um, and one of the panelists from yesterday was a fellow for that, Diego. And then they also have a storytelling department. So if you're in science, if you're in humanities, this is an opportunity for you to share your story. It doesn't matter your culture. Um, and learn how to connect to the earth in a different way. So they are farm-based, um, but it's also important with water, right? Everything's connected, the water, energy, food nexus. So if you want to learn a little bit more about our region here, uh, farming in this region, agroecology, and kind of that native and indigenous space with farming, you have one right next door. So it's called La Semilla. They have an Instagram, um, and they have a bunch of cool projects coming out. So keep that in mind and contact me or anyone in this room because they do know of that organization as well. So there's opportunities for you all there. Thank you. So there are things happening locally, things that happen all the time. Um, but I, I would like to take some time for some Q&A with our wonderful throw and catch microphone. You <laughs> do need to speak into the mic because we have our folks um, online that if you don't, they won't be able to hear the questions. So who dares to go first? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Questions, comments. Oh, this is fun. Ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh. You want to toss it? <laughs> here it goes, here it goes. <laughs> Wow. Cool, it is pretty fun. Okay. My question is, is pretty, oh, it's a, is it a mic? Oh, yeah. wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I thought I was just a question. I was just kind of hating it. <laughs> Do you usually sell out like this, full house? I was actually just talking uh, to, to you. Like, it's such an incredible kind of, I think, testament to the importance of community organizing and relationship building because it's not usually like this. You usually can't get students to come to another lecture that they don't really need to be at. Um, and so I really want to like just say what an incredible job Paola and her team have done. Um, Y'all have been incredible. And I think we should give them a round of uh, applause too because Like I want to send other universities and offices to, to you um, to learn because this has just been incredible. So yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and everything. It's been pretty cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I have a question with that. Um, coming from a culture that is very traditional um, with the word innovation. Everything is about innovation. It's part of the pressure that we have. Why? What does it mean to be new? Why not restoration? Exactly. Oh, and like, when I say innovation, how I've been taught innovation from elders is like that application of the old ways into our contemporary realities and returning back to that. Um, but then also acknowledging too, like not all the old ways were perfect or accessible or honored people with disabilities or honored, um, our non-binary relations. So many of them were, but also some aren't. And so when I say innovation, I, I really, and what restoration is definitely something that I, I do a lot of in my work. Um, I have found that reclaiming innovation in a way that holds space to acknowledge going back, that it doesn't always have to be new in the technical sense, but to be new in that we're applying our old ways into our new ways of being today. And that to me is exciting. And that's how I've been able to get in the door in a couple really technical spaces is by holding space to challenge that understanding of innovation where, again, we don't always have to create something new. And oftentimes the way that innovation is imposed onto us um, makes us think like, and, and makes us overlook in many ways, 
the work of our ancestors and activists that have come before us. And that's something I, I know a lot and interact a lot with climate organizers and activists. What I always really try to encourage and, and let them know is when I hear some of them speak, I, I make sure of making a note and asking like, where, where did you get this information? Where, where are your inspirations coming from? And there's this assumption that this is all new, that this is all a different way of talking about these issues and the different approaches and new approaches. But if you, if you actually look and, and hold space to educate yourself about activism, about environmental activism, social justice activism, there are very few things that, are, that we're doing that we haven't already done before. There are very few research projects and reports that are saying drastically different things than what our predecessors have said. And so to recognize too, and I, I think the innovation pushes this, places this pressure on us to not acknowledge what's been done before because for the sakeness of newness. Um, and that's something that, um, again, why I just am so passionate about understanding our histories um, and acknowledging again, those actions and inactions um, because so much of what I do isn't brand new. Like the seasonal work cycles came from asking, how can we apply those relations to earth in our context today, in the spaces that we have to navigate today? Um, so thank you for acknowledging that though, because there is that pressure to always be new. And then we don't get the funding for returning to our own ways and work in restoration. Um, and so I think that's a really important element of the innovation conversation. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um well one I just want to say thank you this was uh eye-opening I guess inspiring okay. I just want to know how did you start this how do you <laughs> get there here yeah. and doing this and stay motivated I guess. yeah okay I'll speak mostly to my experience in university because I feel like that'll be most relevant a few things I did I did an international development and communication studies uh, double major Bachelor of Arts in Canada at York University, and I streamed in Indigenous Studies. So a couple of things that I did when I was a student. Um, one, I went to a session every single month like this, like one that was promoted around campus, a workshop, etc. And I always made sure every month for five years that every other month I had to go to a session that was completely beyond my realm of interest and expertise. So like where I went in knowing absolutely nothing about the subject or where I was maybe uncomfortable with the point of view at, uh, of which that topic was being presented. And I do that with my books too. I'm always reading a book on history and I, I have to alter, I make myself alternate between books that I agree with or think I'll agree with and books that I don't. Um, and it's really helped me in my activism and being able to come to someone's level and understand where their hate comes from. Um, and so that has really helped me in navigating this world and in and, and broadening my experience and, and sources of knowledge is creating that interdisciplinary space. The second thing was internationalizing my education. So in my second year of university, I went to Istanbul for a year and I studied there. Um, and then when I came back, I went on regular trips and exchanges throughout my degree. And that really helped me find direction in my work. Whereas I'd always been an activist, I'd always been a humanitarian. Um, I started a library when I was 16 and that really got me into public speaking and humanitarian work. Um, I had traveled to Ghana and worked on uh, with First Nations in my territories. And so for a lot of my university degree, I found myself just trying to do all this global humanitarian work. And it wasn't until I came back from Istanbul and I had to ask myself, okay, well, first, you were not the best person to be doing a lot of that volunteer work. Why were you romanticizing global humanitarian work over the work that you could be doing at home? And why wasn't I holding that as valuable work? And so while I'd always been an activist, that was when, when I came back, that was when I started bringing it into my education, where I started choosing paper topics that allowed me to explore that while also contributing to my credentials. Um, and so that was really significant. And that's what internationalizing my education allowed me to do was to really be aware of my worldview and relationships, because when you are educated under a different 
education system, and I'm sure many of you relate to this, it is very confronting for your own worldview when you were placed in a place that does not reflect it um, or does not honor it. And so internationalizing my education was also a very significant factor. And then mentors. Mentors are what got me into this line of work as my full-time work. Um, again, I've been doing public speaking and research and policy work. And when I was a student, I was volunteering 30 hours a week sometimes after having Zyra. Um, Cause Zyra started coming to class when she was 12 days old. And so I had my daughter, I had a full course load, an honors course load, and then I had um, all this volunteer work on top of a couple jobs. But really what helped me get to a place where I could do heart work and heart work only was the support of my mentors. And the way that, and just a really quick kind of tip that I have for looking to mentors and for finding mentors and establishing relationships with them is asking that question of what can I do for you? Every mentor relationship that I've had with elders, with academics, with researchers, even with like celebrities is asking, what can I do for you? Because what you're doing in that question is not only recognizing that someone is approached with extractive requests a lot. Can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? But then you're also positioning, your, positioning yourself as having value. Like, oh yeah, I have something valuable that I can contribute to you. What can I do for you? Yeah, I might not have 20 years in the field, but that is a source of qualification to not have learned the way things have always been is a way that I can contribute to the work that you're doing. And so asking that question of what can I do for you? Um, and I ask this question in a lot of different parts of my life, but especially in mentors and who started bringing my, my first paid like research contracts and helped me break into like, I, I do a lot of conflict resolution work uh, in and within the legal system. And so that all was born from that question of what can I do for you? Um, so going to sessions every month and especially going beyond your immediate interests or experiences or perspectives and then internationalizing your education. And then um, the last point around mentors and asking what can I do for you are three ways that I that really helped me um, stay true to a pathway that I had, I've always really been on, um, but definitely gave me the skills and capacity to make this work in the capitalist colonial structures and societies that I'm navigating and that we're all navigating. So I hope that helps. <laughs> Great question. Thank you. Throw it. <laughs> um, thank you. So, thank you so much, Larissa. This is, was so beautiful in so many ways. And, um, but what I really loved so much was all your ongoing discussion about time. And um, so I work in academia and I have administrative responsibilities. And I don't know if there are administrators of the university in the room, <laughs> but um, there are also many of my dance colleagues here. And I'm very grateful for that because we have a big problem. Uh, many of the people in this room now are dance students. And um, we have, as dance faculty and dance students, a problem. We are tired. We are tired and we don't have time to engage as much as we would love to in other interests, activism that we wanted to pursue, and maybe even time to think, you know, to reflect, to rest our bodies. Um, I'm wondering if you can share how you um, manage time and even the word manage is capitalistic, <laughs> but how you organize time and you leave time in future ancestors and how you negotiate time with your collaborators. Love and if <laughs> and if you happen to um, coach uh, about time with mm. institutions and maybe if you can help mm. us in the future. Yeah, yeah, Thank no, you. we definitely do that work. We work with a college or university in every province and territory in Canada. So that's definitely something we do. Um, in terms of how we navigate this, so maybe I'll start with the organization and then just go a little personal. Um, with organizations, this is a really big part of 
recognizing also the privilege that I carry. I carry quite a bit of privilege to be able to say I'm going to work a four day work week. I don't work on Mondays. I have a four day work week. Um, and that came from, again, when I was sharing those reflection questions in relationship to time, that was acknowledging that I need at least one week, one day a week where I can be out of cell phone reception and I live 30 minutes away from the mountains and I can be out there. And that, that is what I need for my health to stay productive, to be able to work sustainably in this work. Um, but there's a degree of privilege with that. When we aren't able to honor relationships to time, well, first off, we always include our, de our statement on the decolonization of time in our out of office um, emails, email responder. And uh, you have access to the decolonization of time. You can actually go and just use that. You can, you can use our document. Um, it's open access for everyone. If you make your own, just cite us. But uh, I, I really try to share that information because um, sometimes people just need to be confronted with the research and they get scared into it. Like, because we have clients who like, will say like, look at the racist history of productivity. <laughs> look at this deadline. And when we say that, sometimes it's enough to scare people in to honoring it. And what's beautiful is that so many clients after sending an urgent, what they name as urgent in their initial email, once they get that responder and once they get that research, oftentimes, and like not all the time, but oftentimes they'll send a follow-up email and say, sorry, like this actually wasn't as urgent as I said, like, please take your time, heal, um, get back to me when you can. And so sometimes I find that it, just expressing and sharing this research is enough to address some of those issues, but it's also very structurally ingrained into our deadlines, our grants, our expectations, um, and there are a lot of different sources of, like regarding that. Um, but with us, that looks like, because a lot of our clients have year end in March. And so we can't control how aggressive those deadlines are going to be in March. Like we can't control that. We can't, in many ways, our capacities to honor our relationships to time is decreased exponentially in March. And so when we hold space to at least recognize that, um, that's when we start planning for, okay, well then what is it really important to do before and after those really intense times? Um, what is it, when is it important to schedule rest or to schedule work that doesn't require the same kind of energy as that really intensive time? And so, with work with our, I'm thinking specifically to the work that we've done with universities, that's looked like shifting some of their deadlines and requirements for teachers to submit evaluations or to submit their syllabi, um, or at least creating, in some cases, we've created like different kinds of um, policies or shared expectations to hold space for um, negotiating kind of those deadlines and schedules based on circumstances, identities, who's involved, et cetera. Um, so those are a couple of different ways, um, but I would say, and I didn't include this in this slide deck, but you'll be able to see it in the resources. One practice that we do at Future Ancestors and that we do with a lot of our clients is implement our directions of respect. And so we have a document at Future Ancestors Services that everyone makes when they are onboarded. And it says how to respect them in the workplace and in relation, but then also how to respect their time, how to respect their energy, how to respect them when they're experiencing trauma. And so we have a document where we proactively reflect on this and then discuss it with each other. So every season we check in with each other, hey, are there any updates or is there any ways that we're not honoring each other's needs for respect? And again, time and relationship to time gets woven into that. Um, but then it becomes, a structural element of how we relate. And there's been times where we haven't felt like our time was respected by our peers, especially when we think of workplace boundaries and when we're working, when we're not. And those dot and having a document of our directions of respect, not only is a receipt and serves as a receipt, you all read this, you all agreed to this, and I'm not feeling like my needs are being honored or being respected. Um, 
then you're able to use that as a conversation starter and then as a source of accountability. But it also holds space that when you're initially going over these directions of respect for everyone, you're able to identify where there may be conflicting needs for respect. So maybe for one, it's punctuality, and for other, it's flexibility on start times or arriving late or early. Now, when we have this conversation up front, we're able to identify, okay, this, is, this may cause issues because I need flexibility because of my caregiving responsibilities. Well, I need punctuality because this, this, and this. And so we're either able to acknowledge, one, if someone comes in, if this person comes in late, you have to have an understanding that it's not of disrespect or value towards your work. And then we can move forward. But more often than not, it ends up being one, we can't let you come in half an hour late. And so, but to even acknowledge we are so sorry, we are not able to respect this need or this experience of time. Oftentimes when I brought in for conflict resolution, that step alone and that acknowledgement alone, when it's coming from a sincere and authentic place in, and to demonstrate that I see you, I'm acknowledging the reality that we can't change right now, but I see you. Sometimes that's enough for people to feel respected. But then also we can find some compromises like, okay, like come in late, but if it's more than 10 minutes late, we'll have someone send you the meeting notes. And so we're able to identify those conversations to proactively mitigate the tension that will arise from not being able to honor certain people's relationship to time. Um, and then also finding those opportunities to create a more respectful and cohesive space. So I know like that, that kind of went everywhere um, in terms of my per personal relationship to time, what time? Speaking on that, what time is that? Okay, I, I do know that there's a class coming in right, right now. So I will also say though, um, in terms of the resources, um, time is a colonial construct. Here's how I learned to reclaim mine. This has a bit more specific and business and like structural elements of organizing together. And then reimagining care and healing. This is an article I wrote that much more specifically examines kind of just my personal experience and journey in decolonizing and really indigenizing the way I relate to productivity and time. So that when I do have my personal time or when it does come to creating the boundaries and asserting my boundaries, that I'm able to do that from a place of understanding that rest and healing are productive uses of my time. And so that's really an article that I, I write to, especially for the places that I've been in my life where I haven't been in institutions that have honored my need for rest and time. Um, that's really where I've been able to kind of um, explore that uh, for when I don't have the agency to change where I am. Um, so I know we're at time, so I'll just leave this here again. QR code for the slides and my contact information for if you want to stay in contact. <laughs> <laughs>